Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are still on site in Manhattan, in New York City, New York. And we are now at the New York Comedy Club, which is an amazing venue that's had a plethora of different leading comedians that have performed here over the years. And huge shout out to them for hosting us. We are gonna be talking about all things comedy, all things science communication, the importance of these pressing conversations at this inflection point in civilization. I'm really excited to be featuring Chuck Nice. Hey. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey man, it's great to see you again. You yeah, know? Too. Glad you're here on the East Coast, you yeah, know? Yeah. It's always good. Yeah. You do a great job with, you know, bringing science down to earth for people and promoting science literacy and putting information out there that, and making it accessible to an audience that otherwise would not be able uh, to contact this information. So I really appreciate you. Chuck, thank you so much for those words and I'll, I'll double his pay afterward. That was so good. <laughs> so, and oddly enough, I'll still be getting paid the same. <laughs> and so basically everything Chuck said about me, Chuck does himself as well. Chuck's been, he was born in Philadelphia. He's a comedian, actor, television host, radio host, podcast host. And this is across 46 television shows, yes. which is crazy. So it's a, just a myriad of different programming that he's hosting and co-hosting. And he's been doing comedy for almost two decades now. Wow, now, <laughs> somehow that sounds really bad. <laughs> it's, it's great, because that's the, that's the accumulation of experience over time. Yeah. And same thing with all of the programming that you've been on. And this is, this is everything um, from the Radio Chick Show yeah. all the way to uh, playing with science, with Star Talk, mm -hmm. um, also the Today Show, all yeah. different types of stuff that you've been a part of. Yeah. And okay, so Chuck and I have, um, oh, and Chuck's, cool, Chuck's really cool TED Talk. We'll put that link in the bio as well. Oh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good TED Talk. A funny look at the unintended consequences of technology. And again, you really take that sort of, you're at the edge of knowledge point. You're like, here's biotech, here's AI, yeah. here's social media's effects on us. Yeah. And I don't really do a deep dive into it like you would expect from some of the other TED Talks, which are far more narrow in their subject matter. Uh, what I do is an overarching, um, broad look at human interaction and technology and hopefully by being funny about it, it there are some thought-provoking you know touch points that say okay yeah you know like okay this is what we're actually doing and uh, and, and technology can be a little um, scary for some and it can be scary for real and then the perceptions of it I think what we think is going to be is going to be Somewhat, but nothing like we think, you know, going forward. I, and I, I only say that from looking at like world's fairs in the past, but the difference now is that many futurists and uh, people who are driving technology forward, they, it's not coming from a place of, wouldn't it be great if we, or what if cars could fly? It's actually a, a more algorithmic progression of technology now. And uh, as a result, things that you know, are mind blowing come to fruition so much quicker, mm -hmm. so much quicker, which means they also enter obsolescence so much quicker. And so that's why I think we're not going to see the future the way we uh, uh, imagine it to be. Not because it won't actually be heading that direction, but because we'll actually skip over some of that stuff. We have a lot to evolve our own ethics and our own unity wow. across Earth. And we're just leaping to transhumanism without really figuring out ourselves as just advanced chimps first. Wow, that now right there is a whole show what you just yeah, yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is like <laughs> our own I mean, yeah, yeah. No, seriously, that's a book. Yeah. What you just said. That's a yeah. It's, uh, that is kind of what. That's kind of what I uh, I fear most about it. And that's kind of what my TED talk. The the very uh, you know the the final takeaway from it is really about. You know what you have to do? You have to find out where is your humanity? What is it that makes you a human being? What causes you to be a human being as opposed to just an advanced ape, which is what we are? I mean, think about it. Uh, I, I watched, I've never seen the entire movie, uh, but the 
something War of the Planet of the Apes or something, yeah. and, the, the, and the chimpanzee Caesar uh, comes into, uh, you know, all chimps are already sentient, but uh, he comes into a self-awareness that human beings have, the, the Descartes, I, I think, therefore I am. He has that moment, and then in a moment of defiance, he speaks. And his first word is, no! And I'm like, oh, that's some real stuff. <laughs> like, that's very, very real. And what is it that separates us from that? That yeah, I yeah, think is yeah. the real question. That's a good. That's a good way to put it. And I, I think part of it is our ability to realize that we were birthed from the cosmos, and that we are then figuring out how to work together on this rock. And that's part of the. Th without humans on the rock, I think the rock would just do its normal nature evolution. But humans being stewards of the rock then make it so that we can really understand where exactly we came from. We can understand the code of the universe, the math, and then we can get off the rock to the next rocks. But we gotta learn how to have that empathy and that and that unity and that altruism, and I think that's another thing that separates us is being able to raise the baseline of living for everyone around the planet. Yeah, yeah. and you know, it's funny because uh, I, I, what you're talking about um, on a more everyday level, I had a conversation with my wife uh, yesterday, and we were looking at, you know, we were unfortunately watching the news, now, you know, which we, you know, we don't do a lot. We read the news more, you know, because it gives you a different perspective. But when you watch the news, it's scary. And because that's what they're trying to so, elicit yeah. from you. They want, they're selling fear. Okay, let's be honest. I mean, you know, you don't turn on any cable news outlet to feel good. You actually, and you can become addicted to that. You can come, become addicted to that feeling of, oh my God, what the hell is happening? Oh, we're all, you know, and, and that becomes what, that becomes the commodity that they're trading. It. And, you know, and we, after about a half hour uh, of like little bits from what's going on around the world, and of course, uh, domestically, and I, I just turned to her and I was just like, the whole world is effed up because of money yeah. money it's like you can just trace everything right back to greed selfishness um uh, not even self-preservation but self-elevation saying i'm better than you so i should i deserve this you don't uh i need more and therefore you can't have uh, uh you know all of these problems come right back to humanity where is our humanity? And when you reach a place yeah. of, um, so I, I look at it like marriage. Good marriage works like this. I think about you before I think about me. And if you just keep doing that for the rest of your life, you will stay married. If you both keep doing, doing that, that yeah. you will just stay married. You can't help it, yeah. okay? I'm gonna think about you before I think about me. And that, can, you know, if you were to take that and just knead it out like dough and expand it to the entire earth, boom, guess what? 90 something percent of our problems, poof, they disappear. Yeah. They disappear. Why? Humanity. Humanity. Yeah. Where is our humanity? And Chuck, you bring up this really interesting point that when we look back thousands of years and we, and we think about what it was like to approach someone and ask them, you know, oh, who owns this land? And what do you mean owns, owns. this land? Right. This is Earth's land. Right. We're just farming on it. Right. This is just what we do. Yes. And we live on it. And so the whole, I, and then now another big thing, and we don't typically think about this one, but just in the last hundred years, just the hockey stick of population, that's been, it's, it's, it's actually um, people moving to metropolises for opportunity and the network effect has crowded these metropolises to insane degrees and extents. And that's also a major I wouldn't know what you're talking about. I live in New York. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we, we are doing a lot of big history and we're doing a lot of uh, civilization design conversation right now and we'll do more of that in a, um, towards the end. I want to I ask Chuck about um, comedy because okay. this, this seems to be 
uh, something that it's it's almost an essence that we carry around with ourselves. It's kind of like humor and fun and play, yeah. and it's something we can carry through from childhood through our adult life. And and you almost you train your cognition faster to be able to like make those comedic entries into into your situations in life and it's really cool so teach us about how you picked it up and how you continue to use it in your you know in your daily life why it's important so i don't think i picked it up because i um okay well i'll tell you my first comedic experience and when i knew and i knew that this was my trajectory in life okay i was giving a speech in the second grade in front of a assembly that had all the students and parents of the second grade. And I was wearing a bow tie. It was part of the outfit that they asked for me to wear. And as I was giving the speech, which one, you know, a lot of kids would be very um, um, frightened to get in front of a large group. And that I did not know that I was supposed to be afraid to speak in front of a large audience. And that's why I was picked to do it, because I had this natural inclination to speak in front of people. It didn't bother me. As a matter of fact, I was unaware that there was a large group of people looking at me. Um, and I wore a bow tie and it was clip-on. And the teacher didn't clip it on properly and it fell off in the middle of my speech. <laughs> it just, it literally hung, it dangled. And people started laughing, and I didn't know why, and I looked down, and when I looked down, it fell. And then they laughed some more. And so I <laughs> bent down, I picked it up, and of course, I can't see, so I thought I clipped it on, and I put it, and it fell again. <laughs> and I started enjoying the fact that people were laughing at that, yeah. then I was enjoying giving the speech. <laughs> and, and so at that point, I just kept allowing that to happen while, and then I finished the speech, yeah. and I kept doing it, and the people loved it. Yeah. They loved it, and the teacher was <laughs> horrified. And she was like, in the future, something you should know about the stage. When something goes wrong, you don't acknowledge it. You just keep moving because no one knows that something went wrong. But once you acknowledge it, they are now tuned into that and that's what they're focused on. And I was like, no, when you do something wrong, you just keep moving. When I do something wrong, I'm gonna have fun with I it. I make fun of myself. I'm gonna make fun. <laughs> this is great. Yeah, okay. I loved it. Yeah. I lo and you know, from that point forward, I knew something there was something about laughter that I really enjoyed, and giving it, like yeah, not yeah. just like giving laughter. Yes. I really liked it, and I, I guess a lot of people would have been mortified by the fact that they're, they're on stage, people are laughing, and they're kind of laughing at you because you're doing this thing. That didn't bother me at all, I liked it. And so that's kind of where it all started for me, that one experience. And what that experience did was it, act, it, it served as a catalyst and I started looking for ways to make people laugh. And um, people were always like, you're very funny, you're funny, you're funny. But being funny and being a comedian, two totally different things. Mm -hmm. And I am a performer, but I'm also a comedian. And not a lot of comedians bring the two together. If you notice, if you watch comedy, it's a lot of guys standing and they're like, so the other day, I was, uh, it's more of a conversation. Okay, sure. And I don't really like doing that. I like performing. Okay. I like being animated. Yeah. I like seeing the different looks on people's faces. Mm -hmm. But I also love writing jokes and having a narrative arc and then having an unexpected or uh, uh, ending to that narrative arc, which elicits laughter. And so, you know, that's kind of, for me, how it all came about. Um, and I've been doing it almost 20 years. I was on this very stage last night. <clears throat> I did two shows right here, and they were killer shows. And so it's the only thing that I do that I've never become bored. You're constantly iterating on your creative ability through comedy. Absolutely. And everything. It, and it, it, this is why I love science. Okay, so like, I, I love science because the more you learn about science, 
the more you learn, there's more science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that is the greatest thing about science. It's like the more, and I don't care what it is, from biology to neuroscience to the cosmos, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make a difference that no, no matter what it is, you, you, you find something out and then it becomes more granular and then it becomes even more granular and then it's like it, you can just go so deep into it. And, and then you realize, oh my God, like that's here, but it's also here. And then it's there. And then you look at it and you're like, oh my God, science is, everything, everything. is science. Yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Well, everything is comedy too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's so cool about it. And that's the two, that's what they share for me. Yeah. Is like, everything is comedy. And you can find it anywhere. And the greatest joy that I have watching other comedians, which I don't do very often, but the greatest joy that I have is seeing their perspective and how they found comedy in something that I thought there was no comedy in whatsoever. And yeah, yeah. it's like, like there's a, uh, a big question that is asked. Is there such a thing as a funny rape joke? And I'm like, first of all, that's a really lousy question. Like, you know, that's one of those, uh, uh, set up questions, you know, because you know it's going to be a controversial answer. But the short answer is, yes, there is. Mm -hmm. And I've heard quite a few. Mm -hmm. And it all depends. Like, I've heard a woman tell, and they're, some are offensive and some are clever. Mm -hmm. But that's what you're really asking is, is it offensive? And offense is something that lies in the ears of the beholder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about right there. I love the story that you gave about you being a kid. It actually teaches us to not be scared or not be fearful of taking a leap into something that is unexplored for us. Because when we learn how to do that over and over again, it takes us to the next level. It's like leveling up. You yeah. know, as a video game character. Right. And we have to gain these attributes and skills. It's one of the best ways for us to, to learn and grow. And you and that 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 story also that story also speaks to, you know, you getting your flow into the field and then and then I like how you you know how you talk about there's always something different about comedy for every person. Yeah. And then also when you do watch uh, someone else perform, you see what they find to be funny and right. how they talk about it. And I'm glad you mentioned the science because, you know, we can we can uh, we can move into your roles in science communication as as you see the world as all comedy and all science and the the interconnectedness of all things. Period that it gives you, you basically get more material yeah. for comedy by seeing the world through a scientific lens. Absolutely. Um, you know, and the funny thing is I don't talk about science in my comedy. Um, and people say, oh, you should, you should do that, you know. Uh, and it's because I don't have anything good enough yet, but I, I have looked like, like I'm working on some things that I would like to bring into my act, but. The thing is this, when you talk about science, and I think it's very important uh, when you talk about science that you have to do it in such a way that it's inviting. A lot of science right now, I shouldn't say science, science is just science, it doesn't do anything one way or the other. A lot of science communication and, and, and mostly by scientists. People like you actually open science up to a greater audience. But many scientists, and this is not a knock against them, it's just because they are isolated in their own community. And communication is not something that they must learn. And I think that part of any science discipline should be classes in communication. Mm -hmm. Like you should know how to talk about what this thing that you love so much and that you're, you should know how to talk about it, not in the way that you would talk to another scientist, but in the way that you would talk to Chuck Nice, mm -hmm. who may not be the smartest guy in the world, but wants to know wants to know what you're talking about. And I think that the problem is there's an intellectual superiority um, complex that many scientists have. Rightfully so, okay? When someone, just because someone says, oh, you think you're superior, it's like, no, I don't think I'm superior. Scientists are superior in many ways in certain areas, but we all are superior in many ways in certain areas. Uh, I like thinking about it as an edge. So they're, they've gone to the edge of knowledge in a specific field, and so they're trying to talk to other people at the edge, at the edge. so that they can move the edge forward for society. Right. And so when, when, and when someone like, like us says, how do you make that relatable for people closer into the center, right. then, then there's a, there's, 
There are people that want to just be genius at the edge and not work on the communication, and that's which fine. is great. And that's fine, but don't, yeah. don't talk to people. <laughs> okay. You might defer, defer them, deter them away from it. Right, yeah. Scientists. Talk to other scientists. Yeah, yeah. Don't talk to people, okay? Because you're doing a disservice when you talk to people. Um, you know, uh, I look at it like um, NFL uh, analysts and color commentators. The analysts and color commentator make the game, they're not necessary. If you like football, you don't need to hear this guy just tell you that that guy ran five yards and was tackled. I just saw that. I don't need you. But what they're doing is they're bringing the inside game outside. And it makes you feel like I know more about football now. I understand this game. And then before you know it, you're watching the game and you'll see it and you're like, oh, damn, that's holding. You know, ah, they're going to call that play back. That's whole. And before you know it, here you are. You're coaching. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you know what I mean? You're coaching the Eagles. You're the, you know, you're the, you're coaching Kansas City. You're just like, why, why would they do that? Like, you know more than the professionals playing the game. So you think. But that's what makes it exciting for you. And so that, I think, is what has to happen with, um, with science is yeah, that yeah. we need more people. It's not a spectator sport. Right, it's not a spectator sport. We need more people to activate other minds yes. so that they understand this is not relegated to a bunch of eggheads sitting in a room discussing ethereal matters. This is actually real life that is happening all around you at all times and you're a part of it and you should know. Yeah. You should know. For instance, there's a comedian, I will not say his name, because uh, I actually know him, but he does a joke about how molecules are a part of everything, which is true. Everything has a molecular structure. And there are molecules in my hand, but there's molecules in the air. But my hand, when I hit a wall, doesn't pass through, mm -hmm. right? First of all, it's not molecules that he's really talking about. What he's really talking about is the space between atoms and how if you look at the space between electrons and a nucleus, it's, it's like space itself. Mm -hmm. It's mostly empty. Mm -hmm. So why is it that things don't pass through one another and stuff like that? And he says, and scientists don't know why. That doesn't make any sense. And I'm like, no, scientists do know why. What are you talking about? Well, they do know why. What you're talking about is the fact that certain things are unobservable and that's what they don't know. But we do understand why I hit this and my hand doesn't go through it. We do understand that. And so I only say this because as I was listening to him, I'm like, you're doing a disservice to science. Like, damn, man, like you're making people think that scientists don't understand the most simple scientific thing when they actually do. And then something said to me, you know what? He's telling a joke. Lighten the hell up, Chuck. Seriously. Why don't you lose the molecules in your ass? <laughs> <laughs> And just let the guy tell a joke. At least he's talking about molecules, okay? Maybe somebody never thought about molecules and that could be a good thing. So, you know, I get, that's why, I, like I said, I don't, I want to bring science into my comedy, but I want it to be, I, I really am reverent. I, I, I want it to be something that is funny, but at the same time thought provoking, you know? Yeah. yeah. The, the, our, our ability to advance the minds of children and adults to have a more scientific lens goes hand in hand with entertainment and comedy, creativity, and, and seeing the world through that augmented lens is critical for this inflection point that we have. Yeah. Because if you know about how some of the underlying principles of biotechnology work, or how the underlying principles of AI or neurotech or blockchain and cryptocurrencies work, it'll advance your ability to have discussion with other people in your community and around even federal issues or global issues around yeah. these topics. And you know, you make a very important point, and that is that um, these, uh, the interconnectedness of science and your condition are inexorable. They cannot be separated. Uh, and so the more you know about it, the better off you are. Let's just take climate, for instance. I mean, let's be honest. Um, there are very many people who see climate and their belief in whether, what I don't call it climate change anymore or global warming, I call it human caused climate disruption. Mm -hmm. That's my name yeah, for it, yeah. human caused climate disruption. It's a lot to say, but you know exactly what you're talking about. We're doing things and so the climate is changing. We're disrupting the climate, our actions. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people who don't believe that because they think it's an affront to their identity. And that's because they don't want to, they're not scientifically literate. 
they don't want they don't trust science to begin with and that's a problem uh, some of that is religion or you know based on religion which i think is terrible because i tell people this all the time if there is a god he invented science <laughs> so you know when the laws of the universe say this this and this has to happen if there's a god he's the one or she's the one or it's the one that made that law happen yeah. so you can't even if even it doesn't make a difference if uh, you say well scientists are atheists not true there are many many scientists that believe in god um, they just don't attribute the things that you do to God. You yeah, know? You're making an important point, which we try and make all the time, is that the idea of God is just such a flexible thing that the God could just be the what came pre-Big Bang that caused everything to happen. Absolutely. And if that is what someone thinks is God, then the code of what we live in is math physics right and so then now you you were making this point about climate science and I want to um, and I want to um, anthropogenic or human caused okay. climate change mm -hmm. um, Chuck would you want to talk about your project as well oh sure man so and anybody who can help with this we are open if you're a scientist if you're an entertainer if you're somebody who can help with this project I am open to receiving whatever it is that you have to bring I am putting together and efforting the very first Digital Youth Climate Summit that will happen online, that will happen on YouTube, because what we're doing is we're not trying, we're trying to bring the mountain to Muhammad. We're not waiting for people to get involved. What we want to do is activate a youth culture with respect to uh, climate disruption and climate chaos. We want young people to realize that this is their issue, uh, kind of the way the Parkland shooting activated young people to say, we're going to make a change about these gun, this gun BS. We call BS. That became their cry for change. And we want to do that with climate with young people between the ages of 16 and 25. And the reason is, if you're 16, you're going to be voting very shortly. Mm -hmm. So you need to ramp up to that. And 25, you're probably just out of college and you're still idealistic. And you know that you can make a change. What has to happen is these people have to be activated. Right now, everybody has a cerebral knowledge that climate uh, and climate disruption is actually happening. We see it all the time. Bigger storms, you know, co actually colder uh, 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 spurts in the winter, along with warm spurts. Like, it's chaos. It's, that's what we know that it's happening. Parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Absolutely. Yeah, so, you know, over 400 now uh, from 300. Absolutely. Yeah. And the reason why we know that is because we drill into ice, we pull out these little cor cores, and we count bubbles. It's that simple. Okay? It really isn't like it's not deep. Ocean acidification, Ocean which acidification. is killing, killing coral reefs, yeah. and like, and, and it's gorgeous. Yes. It's gorgeous. This is part of our soul. Is the human, the Earth's right. soul, is right there in those beautiful, and we can take so much inspiration and love, and and understanding of how things evolved as right. a planet from it. And, it's, and the fact is that all these things are measurable, and they're all interconnected. Okay, yeah. so I hate to sound like you know I'm a character in the movie Avatar, just like it's all one planet, it's all connected. You know, I see you like. Uh, like, but as corny as that is, that's really like the soul yeah. of climate disruption and what you just said. It is all one thing, okay? There's no such thing as weather. It all starts and ends all in the same place, okay? And so what we're trying to do is get young people to say, we call BS and force political will, force individual change, force an adoption of alternatives, okay? And that can be done with the right amount of pressure, pressure placed upon our politicians, pressure placed upon, more importantly, our corporations, yeah. and pressure placed, ultimately, upon ourselves. Yeah. Because you saw what happened in France. Um, Macron said, look, gas is gonna be this. We're putting a tax on it, and that's a good thing, by the way. It's painful change, okay? If your shoes are slightly too small, you will walk in them and you will take them off at the end of the day and your feet will hurt and you will say, ooh, thank God I'm out of those shoes. But if your shoes are a size and a half too small, you will not walk in them. You will be like, I didn't do 
no shoes. <laughs> and that's the kind of change that we need. <laughs> and so we need painful change. Yeah, yeah. And that's what he was, that, but you know, guess what? People revolted. Yeah, yeah. Why? Because ultimately we're not putting the onus on ourselves. When it comes down to our convenience, our pocketbook, when it comes down to our lifestyle, that's when we go, well, I don't know. But guess what? All that's going to go away anyway if we don't do something. So that's the idea behind the movement. And here's what the movement is. I did all that talking and didn't tell you what the movement was. I didn't tell you what we're doing. Yeah, what yeah. we're doing is we're taking entertainment, only entertainment, and we're messaging everything about climate through entertainment. So it's scientists and celebrities and the biggest YouTubers on the planet all coming together to bring this message in one big program and one continuing program. So that's the whole thing right there. Yeah, the Digital Climate Summit. The Digital Climate Summit, man, which, you know, yeah. and uh, it's, a real, it's a real bear to put together. It, it's, 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 a, it's a great blend, like you're saying, it's sort of the powerhouses of, of entertainers, the powerhouses of scientists, the powerhouses of, of leading YouTubers, put it, piecing these things together and inspiring the youth. And I like how you say, you know, it's about the political change and the corporate change, but it's also about the youth realizing that we have have the power to become entrepreneurs and artists and make these big changes through media right. and through companies ourselves. And then another thing that, that came to mind was that there is a, there's a, there's, we already have, we, we talk about this so much, we already have the resources that we need on earth for the baseline of living to be extremely high and sustainable forever. Yep. And we're not allocating the resources, like it's hard to just flick it over like a light switch and transition everything away from, um, from fossil fuels to sustainable forms, but we're really just needing to push all of the marbles over in more effective ways because we have the technologies photovoltaic and solar yep. we have the technologies for all different types of of wind resources and, yep. and also we have tokamak fusion reactors that are really we just need more time investing into them in order to figure out how to just be able to fuse atoms and take out more energy than we put in mm -hmm. and then we're abundantly energy filled forever and that can be used for flying cars and for all other spaceships and all other absolutely cool and listen all that stuff can happen and it's really about the will, human will to make it happen. Think of this, go back to the, uh, before the turn of the century and electricity and we had it, but you couldn't turn on a light and just have let, it was, saw, it was seen as a novelty, like maybe one street lamp. Maybe somebody would have some electricity in their home, like ooh, but it was a novelty. Now you cannot have society without electricity. And so that is what happens when you make a tectonic shift in technology. Yeah. And that's what we need to do with respect to climate. Yeah. And that's yeah. everything that you just talked about. Yeah. Chuck, what would be your like big, um, what would be the most ideal way that the this that this digital climate summit would motivate and then what what change would you want to see in the political corporate uh, entrepreneurial spheres with this media so the first thing that we're trying to do is get people to force political will uh, especially here in America because America is the problem okay let's be honest everybody else is trying to do something about climate they're not doing enough we know that but that's because we're not leading okay China by the way the China uh, a lot of, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about China. They want to be the world's leading economy and they are making huge investments into solar, huge. Now, the largest solar farm that's going to be financed and built will be financed and built by, wait for it, Saudi Arabia. That should tell you everything you need to know. The people who their one thing they have is oil. They are looking towards solar farms as the future. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. That's all we need to know. And what, we're, what are we doing in America? We are divesting. But because we are divesting, that means there's a lot more money to be made in burning fossil fuels. So the first thing that we're trying to do is create a political will amongst people that says, 
hey, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an issues voter. This is an issue. We're not saying that you have to end fossil fuel right now, which by the way, we do, but we're not saying that. What we're saying is we need to start transitioning yeah. right now. So that's the first thing that we want to do is make it, hey, transition. We got to transition. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's the first thing. Yeah. The second thing that we want to do is make it so that corporations realize that this is an issue for them. And all corporations want to be good global citizens if it increases their bottom line. And so they can't wait to tell you that I'm doing something good. Look at what I did. Corporations are like little children, okay? Look at what I did. I did something good. That's what they need. And so we want to force them into that position, but they can only be forced into that position if it means they're gonna make money from it. So that's the second thing that we wanna do. And the third thing that we wanna do, which is chiefly like important. Like if you're not green, people will not buy from you. Boom, yeah. it's that simple. It's that simple. It's like, wait, we see that you support the generation of single-use plastics that actually break down in our oceans and create uh, problems for the ecosystem and ultimately health problems for us. So guess what, we're not gonna give you our money. We're going over to this other company biodegradables. that does biodegradables, this other company that is looking for ways to make sure that none of this stuff ever enters this our ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. That's the company we want to give our money to. Guess what will happen? Company A will say, we got to change. change yeah. Boom. Or, or bankrupt. Yep. All right, that's yeah. it. And so that's the second thing that we're trying to do. And the third thing that we're trying to do, which is most important, is get people to change their mind about this thing. And that's the toughest because the problems which are manifesting themselves more and more, and we thought, well, we're seeing the problems actually happening right now, and so therefore people will have to take note, and they will have to take, no, it doesn't work that way. You see the problems manifest themselves right now, and people look for other ways to deny. That's all they do. So it's kind of like, I look at it like this, Climate and the population's, um, American population's uh, relationship with climate is like a person who's in a relationship with a cheating spouse and they refuse to recognize that that person is cheating on them. And we, I can't say we all know someone like that, but if you're old enough, you'll meet somebody like that. It's like, you, you, you know, your other, your significant, uh, they, they're, yeah. They're doing that with other people, and they're doing it right in front. I don't believe it. I just can't see them doing that. Like, I, mean, yeah. I, I love them. I love and that's our relationship with fossil fuels. Yeah, you know? yeah. And, and with <clears throat> Earth. <clears throat> and with, yeah. So, a <clears throat> couple things. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I would love to see an X Prize style uh, award for um, for the youth to crowdsource ideas. Oh, well, we're doing for, that. So cool. we're, that yeah. part of the program is, um, we're doing a film. Uh, so the show itself is a, a combination of sketch comedy, stand up, short film, um, um, music. Is there so, debates? Uh, there will be, but they're, they're not real debates. So they're. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. conversations? No. Uh, no. The only conversations that will happen are interstitials. In between. In between. Okay. That will happen between celebrities and scientists. Okay, cool. Okay, so, oh, the, cool. so okay. the idea is we want to stay away from uh, didactic uh, information dissemination. Got like, it. do this, so that we don't want to do that. What yeah. we want to do is entertain you for the entire, at the entirety of the show, and at the end, hopefully you'll be like, you know what, I need to do something. Yeah, yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And with specific calls to action throughout the show itself. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, one of the things that we're doing is we're going to have, and hopefully we'll get um, some rich benefactor to be the uh, sponsor of this, an X Prize for short film on climate. Great idea. And so yeah. we're putting out the filmmakers all over the country, and you go make your short film on climate. We will feature you know, the top three in the show itself, awesome. but the number one show will win $25,000. Awesome. So yeah. that's part. So we're doing things like that. There's so many different facets that we're trying to incorporate in this, but it's all entertainment driven, and that's yeah. the that's the whole idea. Yeah, this is going to be, I hope, extremely watched, as in one of the most watched, hopefully, videos that ever. Are I, made you know, we're, we're we're if if we get the right YouTubers involved, the 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 creators, um, if we do that, then we could potentially see, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, by time we chop it up and push it out over social media and leave it as whole 
poll on YouTube itself, we could potentially get 100 million views. That's what we hope for. Yes, that's what we're hoping and, for. And the big, big action push. Um, Chuck, okay, this is a really important pressing topic that's, it's just, it's, it's causing a lot of, of, of unfortunate madness in, in, in many ways. Political correctness in, <laughs> in comedy. Ah, I love it. <laughs> what, what, what do we do? Because there's, there's, we got to retain our ability to, for example, if we make fun of each other, we're doing it in good light. We're trying to, we're trying to poke and play with each other, and we got to be right. more friendly and fun about that. But, but of course, you can't just. You can't be hurtful, hurtful. and you can't be yeah. mean, and you can't. Right, you know. But guess what? Um, there's a couple things has to happen. One, we, we, you know, uh, some sometimes you have to grow up a little bit and realize that not everybody is going to say and do the right thing. That's number one. Um, sometimes people need to be helped to say and do the right thing. And that's what political correctness is supposed to be. Mm. It's supposed to be that I understand that saying that is wrong because, and therefore I change the way I speak because I've changed the way I think. What we're doing now is just, uh, it's just thought police and speech police. Yeah. It's not political correctness, it's speech policing. Yeah. Don't say that, you know? And it's, it's like uh, I said to my son, if you ask me to go to the, uh, there's this RPM, it's a speedway thing. Mm -hmm. I say, if you ask me to go to RPM again, we are not going. So don't ask. And he said, that doesn't stop me from not wanting to go. <laughs> 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 and that's what we're doing with political yeah, yeah. correctness. Don't say that. It doesn't mean I don't think it and I don't feel it. And that's, you know what I mean? So you have a good perspective on kind of like a, a spectrum of things. There's the, like, we should never be uh, treating other human beings as inferior, uh, dehumanizing humans through our speech. Right. So that's like the horrible. And then there's kind of political correctness, which tries on the beneficial side to help the people move into uh, not dehumanizing others. So right. that's the good side. That's a good side. And then there's the bad side of political correctness, the thought police, which is making it so when when I, when we're humorously trying to poke at something, right. we're trying to help people move them forward in different ways. Exactly. And, and expand their awareness. Especially through humor. So for instance, there was a comedian who did a show at Columbia University, I forget his name, and he was kicked off the stage for this joke. Um, I don't think being gay is a choice because there are black gay people and I'm pretty sure they're not looking in the mirror going, you know what, this black thing is just not enough. I need to add something else to this to make it a little more challenging. Right, that's and so a good that's a joke. good joke, yeah. and it's actually true. It's like, why yeah. would you choose to add to your own misery by choosing? No, you're not choosing to be gay, it's what you are. Just like you don't choose to be black, yeah. all right? Yeah. But the stigma attached to that remains nonetheless. That's what the joke means. But what people heard was, black, gay, no! <laughs> no, you can't say black and gay! Yeah. Don't say black and gay! Yeah, what the hell is wrong with you? And so that's really, and we gotta move away from that. Here's how we move away from that. Back to science. Critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Critical thinking allows you to hear a joke and actually listen to it, break it down and go, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um, yes, that's not offensive. I see what you're actually trying to say. Helps Instead of just- find the nuance. Right. Instead of just hearing trigger words and yeah, going, yeah. Ah, and your head yeah, explodes. Yeah. And by the way, you know, everybody says, well, you know, political correctness is how Donald Trump came into power. No, Donald Trump came into power because he actually tapped into a certain uh, angst, one, uh, fear, two, racism, three, all the darker elements of our humanity. He was able to bring them together and coalesce them into what seemed like a positive movement. And so that's how he came to power, okay? but. The truth is that people felt connected to him because he said things that were unacceptable 
And they were like, you know what, I like that guy. He's saying, it, I don't even agree what he did, but I just like the fact that he said, <laughs> I, you know what, well, he's an idiot as far as I'm concerned, but I just like the fact that he said. The bull in the china shop Exactly, mentality. and yeah. so, you yeah. know, this is what PC, this is, this is kind of the backlash to PC, and we gotta yeah, get away yeah. from, the, yeah. you know, we gotta get away from PC in that way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a reach here, I think this might be a decent way to put it, is that there are so many good uh, practitioners of Islam that are not getting the voice that they need to call out the radical Islamists that are killing apostates. Right. And so in this sense with, with political correctness, it would be like we, there's this, the ones that are screaming from the rooftops about the, the, the issues with their obsession with being um, a like um, uh, hurt by by other by other people's words, they're the ones with the loudest megaphone. But the ones that should have the megaphone are the ones that say, "Hey, I'm learning something from seeing it through this comedic perspective. I'm seeing the right. nuance on this issue, like with that joke." So it's again, it's shifting the megaphones. Okay, Chuck. A couple quick questions on the way out. Sure. Um, okay, we like to ask these on the show. What is a core driving principle of yours? Oh man. Um, wow, that's a really good question, and I, it's so personal. <laughs> it's like, but um, my core driving principle is I always want to be a better person. How can I be a better person? How can I be better at uh, being a comedian? How do I take comedy and do something good with it? How can I be a better father? How, am I, how can I introduce my children into society so that they are now an asset to society and not a detriment? How can I be a better husband? How can I be a better friend? How can I be a better communicator? Like being better in moving better towards something good for other people, that's my driving principle. You know, now I fail at that all the time. <laughs> we all do, yeah, we all do. Yeah. I'm an abject failure when it comes to it, but it's what I seek. It's what I truly want. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think that the world could be a better place if we all did that. I'm, a, I'm yeah, basically yeah. a hippie. I'm, I'm, I really am. I mean, I'm like I am. I was born at the wrong time. I am basically a hippie. I just missed the. I should. I should have got. I should have been right there in the '60s, man. I just missed my time because I would have been spinning around in the mud, you know, with some uh, uh, LSD in my system. I don't care. Like you know, I'm. A, I'm, a, I'm a hippie at, at yeah. heart. Um, unity, yeah. yeah. The, the, I like how Chuck is really clear that when we look at the mirror and see ourselves and we're trying to help make ourselves a better person, that we're not going to succeed 100% efficiency from moment one. You don't yeah. start sinking three-pointers. So you, you slowly work on yourself. Maybe you succeed one out of 10 changes, then two out of 10 changes in each year, moving on right. each month. And so yeah. um, that's, a, that's a good way across all these different facets oh, of your yeah. life. And it, and it, goes, it goes all the way across you know like I I used to scream at my son and I sometimes I gotta admit I still do but you know because my father screamed at me <laughs> that's how it works right but I find myself like last night I came home from work right here on this stage and um, I walked in the house and it was 1 30 and he was up playing video games and I I went in and I just went like this <laughs> <laughs> He went, okay, dad. Yeah. <laughs> and, okay. There you so go. Yeah. instead of screaming, <laughs> just standing in front of him and doing like, breathe, like, all right, dude, I am upset. Like, guess what? And it was so much more effective than like, yeah. what are you doing? Like, and so, like, that's what I'm talking about. Like, and, and that shows. He got him. it. Right. Yeah. And that also shows him like, okay, maybe there's a better way to communicate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. That's great. I love that, Chuck. Such a good example. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that speaks to our um, inclination to be more meditative. Um, yeah. I love that. Okay. If you could rebuild civilization from scratch, wow. how would you design it? Wow. Um, I'm going to answer that with a non-answer. It would not make a difference because we would... Fuck it up! No. <laughs> uh, to be honest, there, uh, the, the, the problem with civilization will always be human beings. And so the idea, now by the way, we are the best human beings we've ever been in the history of human beings right now. And people look around and go, the world is a mess and things are terrible. We are the best human beings to ever cross this planet. 
okay, as, as a world. There's always been war, there's always been cruelty, there's always been uh, human degradation. But think about this, not too long ago, when you look at the history of this globe, not too long ago, an eye bat ago, Romans were feeding people to the lions for entertainment, okay? De fights to the death were, are you not entertained, okay? We don't do that now. It's still within us, but we resist that. And so um, how would I build it from, from the ground up? I would make, um, I, uh, oh man, wow, I just got, it, it just flashed into my head. I like it. Uh, we were talking about Planet of the Apes earlier and the ape shall never kill ape. Like, I'd start there. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. That's a good first principle. That's it. I'd just yeah. start with that principle. Yeah. Like, that's the first thing that everyone learns, no matter what. Yeah. Like, the one thing you can do to deny a person everything is to take their life. Yeah. So that's, let, let's start there. Yeah. And then it's like, well, if I can't kill you, well, I guess I got to learn how to get along with you <laughs> because the ultimate, can't, the ultimate solution cannot happen. I cannot. So now, okay, now we got to figure out what is it that allows us to come together and mesh because I can't kill you. So that would be my, that would be my ground up from scratch. It's a good first line of code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, two more. Um, this wouldn't be simulation if we didn't ask you. Do you think we're in a simulation? I think it, we could be, to be honest. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, let's just say if this were just a mathematical construct, uh, we would not know, okay? We would not know. I mean, you think about it. Think about this. I'm give you an idea, I'm gonna let you know. Einstein had a mathematical construct for gravity waves. It worked mathematically and no one knew if it existed or not. And then we got empirical evidence that that mathematical construct was actually the case, okay? Um, gravity itself, what calls one planet to a, another celestial body and causes that body to be trapped in its orbit? Okay, we, we, that was a mathematical construct first, and then it became a reality, all right? So you say, are we in a simulation? We very well could be. It could just be a mathematical construct down on its most granular atomic, subatomic level. It's just as matters, when it comes to matters of particles and how they be, it could mm -hmm. just be an equation. And that could be, well, this could be a simulation. You don't know. Does it make a difference? Nope, I still owe Visa $230 <laughs> at the end of this month. So, that's the real answer. It don't make a difference because you got to live in the simulation if it is a simulation. It's a good thought experiment for adding a scientific lens to our reality and, right. and also to um, potentially realizing that we want to level up in the, in the game. We want to gain as many skill points in this right. game as possible. And those skill points come from helping people, being a better person, creating a sense of unity and value for the world. Um, okay, that's, well, that's cool. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a cool video that, game. Yeah. I, 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 I wouldn't mind living in that video that's game. That's your video game. That's yeah. my video. That's yeah. our video that's, game. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, last question is what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, hmm. Wow. Hmm. I'm going to go with extra soft toilet paper. <laughs> and I only say that because when you live without it for a while, you really do understand just how sublime it is. Um, no. <laughs> no, um, I'm going to say, and this sounds very um, corny, love is the most beautiful thing in the world. And that's because it transcends everything. And it, we don't know if it can be commuted to other animals, but I think it can. When you hear about a dog that walks all the way across the uh, continental United States to find an owner, and that's a real story. Uh, when you look at uh, people who do superhuman feats of strength because they are, that's love. That's them actually looking at another person and summoning a love f for 
humanity for their fellow person and saying, I gotta do something. Uh, when you look at how uh, the connections that you can make just between your own family members and then see those connections actually extend to people that are outside of your family, I think that that is unbelievable. I, I think that's the most beautiful thing in the world is love. And, and when it expresses itself in self-sacrifice, it becomes that much more beautiful. Very, very well said. Thank you, Chuck. Yeah, man. Thank, Thank you. you. It's such a pleasure to see you, brother. This has been a great episode. Uh, and I greatly appreciate having you on the show. And your ambitions in science communication and inspiration and comedy are so great. And we're just honored to have you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you. You do the same. Thank you. We will. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know some of your thoughts about topics we were talking about. Also, check out the links in the bio to the Digital Climate Summit. Chuck's work check those out for us also help join us join us with simulation so we can help doing cool things like coming on site to great places like this and speaking with epic leaders and much love build the future manifest your destiny into the world everyone much love see you soon peace that's it my brother dude that's that was it. great ah, good job good to see you man, man.